Hey guys, a couple quick things I want to tell you, then I'm going to show you a little breakthrough I had with carrots. We've had a hell of a time this season with carrots, and I've spoken to a number of other farmers in the area and it's the same kind of story. We had a cool wet spring followed by a hot, dry and windy summer. Now BC is on fire, there's, there's natural fires all over the place. So a combination of the hot, dry and windiness really, really dries the soil out quick, it gives bad germination, but I've done a couple things. I'm going to show you one bed that I did in the front yard, which I think is going to be a, a really good crop of carrots, so I'm excited. but. They've basically been a write-off as far as our farm is concerned this year. This bed that I planted in the front was for my family. I just wanted to have some carrots to eat. And so I put a little bit of extra elbow grease into this bed to make it really good. And I'll go and show you that in a second. But one thing I wanted to say, or two things I wanted to say, is I've got my book on audio format now. So the book has been read by Diego Fooder. And um, so now you can get that on my website theurbanfarmer.co. The link is always below. And my August workshop is coming up. We still have some tickets for that if some of you haven't signed up yet. We had a killer workshop on the, fir the first time around. This one's going to be even better. We've got people coming from all over the US and Canada so far. So be nice to uh, see a few more of you come up for it. I give people a list of accommodations that you can look for in the area. A lot of people when they were here stayed at local Airbnbs. There's two hotels really close to my house on the main farm and uh, there's even some other deals where you can stay up at the university here for like $200 a week. It's really cheap. So there are decent accommodation options available. Check that out. Those workshops are always listed down below in the show notes as well. And one other thing is I'm going, I've been working on for about a week now, a new section on my website. Um, I've changed some things on my website. There's a, there's a button called resources. You go to that, you can download the free extras thing that's an accompaniment to my book in there. But I'm working on a, a gear list, which is basically a list of all the gear that I use on my farm, linking to where you can buy it, but then linking to a video that I've done on it too. So when you have questions, I'm kind of just trying to build up this resources section on my website that can answer a lot of questions that people have. And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to show you some stuff uh, with carrots. I'm going to show you some stuff we're doing on the farm, but I'm going to spend the rest of the video today just answering some common questions that I get. Uh, things that I see really commonly in the comments and I get tired of typing. So I'm just going to address those today. But before I go in the front and show you my carrots, I just want to show you what we've been working on lately. So the poly in the greenhouse is temporarily off and we have painted with a, we've primed and painted with a really good outdoor paint. All of the posts on the plastic side of the greenhouse to weatherproof it and we've gone and put caulking in seams where the poly touches the channel lock and um, I'm, I'm actually going to put new poly on it because when we went to put the old poly back on it no longer fit and uh, it's not to say we couldn't make it fit it was just extremely difficult and the reason for that is when I had some guys come and install a gut gutter down here last fall and they had to cut the poly off right at the channel lock and um, I didn't want them to do it, but they did that anyways, and so they screwed it up essentially, and now I have to get new poly, which sucks because poly for greenhouses lasts many years. This is another thing people always ask me is how long does your poly last on your greenhouses? And honestly, it'll last as long as you can maintain it. Some of my greenhouses have lasted seven years. So uh, actually, the, the ones that lasted the longest, my Caterpillar Tunnels at our flagship plot, we just changed that poly this year which is the first time in seven years so you can get that long out of it if you treat it right and you don't move it around a lot caterpillar tunnel poly where you're taking it on and off i probably lasts a little bit shorter but i expect that the poly on here once we put this stuff up and north to touch it again it'll last many years so that's what we're working on in here i've got new poly coming should be here tomorrow or the next day hopefully Either way, it's not raining, so it's okay that this is open. It doesn't matter. It's warm right now. In fact, it's actually helped in here keep this greenhouse a little bit cool. Let's go check out the front yard and see what's going on there. Finally, 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 a good germination 
of a carrot crop. And the thing I did here is probably going to be obvious for many of you, uh, or seem like common sense for many of you who are experienced gardeners or farmers. But what I did is I just put a thick layer of compost on the bed and leveled it out with the rake, ran the tilther through it, and you can see, I mean, it's, it's very black. And I've been hand watering it almost every night because carrots, I find, don't do well on drip. But I wanted to just do a bed so that I could have some to eat for myself at some point this season because we've had so many of our beds fail. Um, that's pretty much what I did is I put a nice thick layer on, leveled it out, ran the tilther, and then direct seeded into that, right into the compost. Then I put a shade cloth on it for almost two weeks, about 10 days, and I hand watered it every night. So it's quite meticulous. But I'm very happy with the results because it looks like I've got, I would say just by looking at it, at least 85 to 90% germination, which is pretty good for carrots. I usually overseed them a little bit, anticipating that I'm not gonna get perfect germination. But uh, here we've done we've done really good. I've done these at seven rows because I like to grow a baby type carrot, and uh, so I got seven rows. I use the uh, it's called the YYJ roller for the Jang cedar, and so that's how I've done these. And so now I'm trying to mimic this all over the farm. So I was just at one of our plots across the highway, and really disastrous carrot crop there. Like nothing even came up, and that's because we had a problem with the irrigation had been turned off there for a couple days for some strange reason. And uh, those carrots didn't come up at all. So we're gonna do it again, put a thick layer of compost on and plant them again. So that's the plan with carrots going forward. But season's almost over for carrots. I mean, I do my last planting maybe the second week of August. So I've only got a little bit more time to get some more carrots into the ground for the fall and winter. So fingers crossed. All right, so I've got <laughs> my violet with me, her mom's taken off, so I've got her with me, so I'm gonna keep her on my lap because when I put her down, she starts to cry. So I'm just gonna kind of blast with these questions and if there are videos I've done on these questions, I will put the links to them uh, in, the, in the show notes down below. So the first question is, where do you source your seeds? I have done a video on it before, mainly William Dam in Canada and all of my microgreen seeds come from Mom Spreading Seeds, in, which is a Canadian certified organic seed company. That's mostly where I get my seeds. I get some seeds from West Coast Seeds. I get Salon over from Johnny's. And that's pretty much where I get all my seeds these days. Um, how large is Green City Acres? How many acres are you farming? Well, we're farming less than a third of an acre this year. We're actually probably at about a quarter acre now because we are leaving one of our other plots we're downsizing our farm again because we specialize so much that uh, we found that we are often having more land than we need. So we're going to farm less. Next year, we'll probably be at a quarter acre. And we'll be able to make the same amount of money as before because it's not always about the size of the land. And if you follow my content or read my books, you've seen uh, me talk about many different ways to do that. Is Green City Acres organic? We are organic. Most of the inputs we use on the farm, like all of our compost, all of our fertilizer is certified organic. Most of our seeds are certified organic, though not all of them. But everything we do, we practice organic methods. We're just not certified organic because, to be honest, there's not really that much need for it. We have a lot of demand for our product and, and we have a lot of brand recognition. So certified organic doesn't really provide us any value that we don't already have, so there's no real need for it. And I know some people don't like that, but that's just how it is, that's how we do it, that's what works for us. Do what works for you. Ooh. Okay, next question is, what Salanova varieties are you using? Green Sweet Crisp is 75%, Red Sweet Crisp, Red Butter, and Green Butter, those are the three, are, are the other 25%, so I only use the four types. Um, this next question is a is a is one that I've had a lot and I haven't really done a video on it yet I think I will but they ask about insurance for the farm and so we do have insurance I have like a, a basic liability insurance for my farm it covers a farm basically it's farm insurance it costs me about 500 maybe it's 700 dollars a year and uh, so if somebody were to eat our product and get sick, it would cover that liability. It covers any risk that uh, we have 
farming on somebody else's land, it covers injury. Basic business insurance is really what it is, um, but it is meant for a farm. And so that's, that's the insurance we have. It's nothing really that special. You can call insurance brokers and get all kinds of quotes and, and figure that out. It's, it, there's nothing really special there. Uh, another common question is, why can't you harvest salinova with the greens harvester? The basic idea is because the heads grow outwards and they spread out like this, you can't get the, harv the, the harvester underneath it. It, uh, it, it makes kind of a crappy harvest. So you have to cup it with your hands and pull the leaves up in order to get a clean cut. That's why we harvest it by hand. I think, and I've been talking to Jonathan, a farmer's friend about this, I think there's a way we could fashion some kind of, some kind of um, template thing that goes on the front of the greenhouse, the uh, front of the greens harvester that would pull the leaves up to cut it with the harvester. That would certainly be a huge labor saver for us. Though we do harvest salanova pretty quickly, so it isn't, it isn't a real time killer on our farm. Another common question is, do you save seeds? No, I don't save seeds. I'm not in the business of saving seeds. Uh, I would really encourage anybody who's who hears that question and goes, "Oh, you're not you're not pure enough. You're not hardcore enough to actually look in what it look into what it takes to save seeds." And I'm not talking about saving seeds for your garden. To save seeds for a farm and to save enough seed to actually use on your farm requires a lot of work and a lot of infrastructure and a lot of time. And we don't have time for that on our farms. And I do know some of the some great farmers in Canada who are seed savers, and they'll they'll even tell you point blank. If you're not, if you're just saving seed to use that seed on your farm, don't waste your time. If you're going to save it to sell, then that's something else to look at. But then you've got to have a whole other, you got to have a, a bunch of other infrastructure for that and a lot of time to do it, which I have neither. And I don't, I'm not really interested in being in, this, in the business of saving seeds. I'm happy to buy seeds from good farms and uh, let them specialize in that and, and, and take care of that whole part of the business. Last question, super common one, and I haven't done a video on this specifically, but how do you remove the hulls from the sunflower shoots? Well, it's quite easy actually. The basic idea is, well, there's, a, there's a variety of ways to do it. The first is to make sure you're watering your sun shoots enough. Sometimes underwatering just doesn't let them grow enough. Make sure they're getting enough light also make sure you're planting at the correct density and uh, so from there it's that, that's your growing conditions you know airflow can have something to do with it as well also the seed variety you might have a crappy seed variety some people ask can I use bird seed for for growing sunflower shoots no you can't that's not what they're meant for use seed that's meant for growing a product that way that seed has been bred to deliver a certain result Bird seed, okay, sure, if it's the apocalypse and that's all you have and, and, and you want to eat it yourself, absolutely, go, do whatever you want. But, but don't, don't sell that product. So that, that, that you, might, you actually might have some health risks there as far as like salmonella and, and types of um, disease or fungus that might be on that seed. So I, I wouldn't suggest using those. So going back to getting the hulls off, so a lot of it can be to do with the growing. But the last part is before you harvest, you can shake your hand up and down, rub it on the flat to, and kind of hold it diagonal or, or vertically. Rub your hand on the flat, that might shed some hulls off there. And then when you harvest, you go to wash, hulls are gonna come off there. And then if you spin those in your spinner, not too many hulls come off there, but the, the last place that hulls will come off is if you're using a drying screen, like how we do, hulls are going to fall through that that drying screen onto the ground and you can do that just by tapping the, the bottom of it as they're drying or just move them around a bit that's going to shed hulls off there so there's a, a whole bunch of things in the whole process of that that is going to remove those hulls but mostly I would say the it's in the growing is having your growing conditions perfect so that the hulls just naturally sh shed themselves as the cotyledons open up and get bigger because if you're if your cotyledons are really small and uh, you're not growing a very good variety, then you're going to have problems there. So that is all the time for questions today, you guys. Thanks for tuning in.
Check out my website. I'm going to have the audiobooks up there now. Diego Fooder read the book. Uh, like I said again, tickets for the August workshop are still for sale. And the Queen Creek and Selmer, Tennessee workshops are selling fast. So if you want to attend those workshops, uh, make sure you get the tickets for those. And stay up to date with my website, theurbanfarmer.co, because I'm going to have this resources section in there that has a list of all the stuff that I use and where you can get it and links to videos. All right, guys, talk to you later.